Today we're going to start talking about bootstrapping. That's what we're going to start exploring today. We're going to talk about the general issues, the general concepts, and then we'll start getting into IA32 specifically, because uh, obviously that's what you're going to have to work with. But uh, basically we have this issue that we have a machine that requires a program. But when we turn it on, it doesn't have a program. So the question is, how do we actually get to the point of running our program? That's what bootstrapping is really all about. And so there's this thing called the bootstrap process. It's, um, I think I actually say it on the next point, that uh, there was, it derives from this phrase, pulling oneself up from one's bootstraps, which I don't think that you can draw like the physics like force diagram that shows how that works. But uh, the concept is I have a self sustaining process of you know progression where I, I load each you know the subsequent step and then I can start executing and each step is part of the bootstrap process so um, the thing that I think you'll find most interesting is that it is a series of bootloaders or a series of bootstrapping programs it's not just one and it's not just two there's actually typically quite a number of them involved and each stage has a simple job cross the bridge to the next stage, get the next stage going, and then each stage gets progress progressively more sophisticated. So um, currently we use read-only memory of some kind. Now when I say read-only memory, of course that is a loose definition of read-only memory because uh, you know typically it's electrically erasable, and so maybe it's not even a very accurate term anymore, but something has to be somewhere for the processor to start executing code. So that tends to be how we do it. But you might have wondered, how did they do it before read-only memory existed? And it turns out that there was a variety of unusual ways that people would get these computers started and start executing some programs. So you have to read some limited number of instructions somewhere and then begin executing them. So we used to have punch card readers, and I'm a little bit sad. I still have this dream, since I never got to program a punch card computer, that maybe I'll actually build a punch card drive and hook it up to a computer and actually use it. It'd be really cool to have, I keep thinking of all these old devices, it would be cool to have a USB port on. Like, yeah, here's my USB drive and it's a shoebox full of punch cards and if I need to read it then I just start scanning through punch cards. But uh, anyway, if you had a punch card reader as part of your computer, then what you would do is the bootstrap process would read the first punch card into some memory location and then just begin executing the instructions on that punch card. So your first punch card was always the bootstrap punch card. Okay? And then that would tell the computer how to get the rest of the computer going. Sometimes you had a bank of switches. This was really common to have a bank of switches to either say, this is the first instruction you should execute, probably more for a CISC type architecture where you could have it do a lot of things, uh, or here is the first N instructions that uh, the computer should execute. So uh, IBM 650, just to give you a few examples, 1953 had a bank of 10 10-digit 10 switches. So it had 100 switches that you could set that would basically be the first instructions to start the computer running. And typically they would say, go get me a, a punch card's worth of data or a couple punch card's worth of data load them into a specific address, and then start running that information. CDC 6600 had uh, 12 by 12 toggle switches, so it was, uh, it was a little bit more sophisticated. Um, it was called the dead start panel because it would start the computer from, you know, when it was just previously dead. And uh, that would be the first 12 instructions for the computer to run. And then presumably that's enough to get it going to the next step. But you can see how limited this is in, in uh, what you have space to accomplish and so clearly it's a multi-step process because this is going to start the next level which is going to start the next level and maybe there's even more levels after that. The uh, Altair was um, one of the ones that you may have heard of this from sort of the distant hazy computer past where you actually had a bank of switches and you would set up an instruction and then you would push a button and I would load that instruction and then you'd set the switches and load another instruction, set the switches, load another instruction and so forth until you'd entered all of the instructions for the bootloader and then you could tell it to start and would begin executing those instructions. Now thankfully this didn't have to be done too often because I believe this was stored into magnetic core memory and magnetic core memory holds its contents when it's turned off. So uh, frequently you would not have to do this all the time, you just had to do it every once in a while if something horrible happened to your computer. You know, an electromagnetic pulse or something like that. Um, you also had diode matrices, so if you don't have 
transistors in some read-only memory, then uh, you could always use diode matrices. And so you can see that these would allow you to specify more sophisticated bootloaders. So you have a diode, then you have a one, and an absence of a diode would be a zero. Um, you can basically get onto eBay and look for memories of all these various technologies. There's people selling them uh, to people who have uh, various, um, you know, they're just missed the past. And uh, there's a, a couple of other really unusual memory technologies, which I don't talk about in this class, but you, you come across them and you're like, wow, people store data that way? And it's just really kind of a, a weird thing. Okay, so obviously once we have read-only memory, then that makes things much, much easier. You can cram a lot more information. So now you can actually have our boot loading subsystem provide real facilities. So like I say here, we have sophisticated programs, basic drivers for disks, video, minimal operating systems, if you can call it that. And when we get to UEFI, you'll be like, wow, okay, that really is a basic operating system that is responsible for loading other operating systems. It's, it's pretty sophisticated. And of course, this read-only memory or memory that sticks around when the power is off, so we call it persistent memory, and the program you store in it, that's called firmware. And of course, initially it could not be rewritten. If I wanted to upgrade the BIOS on my original computer, which was an AT, it's all we had, um, I'd have to get in there with the screwdriver, pop the chip out of its socket, and get another chip and plug it in, because that was basically what we had to do. Now it's pretty easy. You typically boot it into some program that can access the hardware directly, and it can just reflash the, the BIOS uh, relatively easily. Okay, so this is, this is where we're at now. And with UEFI, you just dump more programs on the hard disk. It's actually, it uses the hard disk for storing boot software. Now, uh, I just wanted to mention this. It, it actually doesn't fit very well into the lecture uh, flow, but um, I just think this is really funny because Apple actually was capitalizing on how difficult these computers were to use, even back in 1976. So they had this ad that they ran in a magazine. You don't need an expensive teletype. Using the built-in video terminal and keyboard interface, you avoid all the expense, noise, and maintenance associated with the teletype. So you don't need that printer on the output end to print out the results of your program running. And the Apple video terminal is six times faster than a teletype, which means more throughput and less waiting. So they were excited about that. Then they had this section. No more switches, no more lights. Compared to switches and LEDs, a video terminal can display vast amounts of information simultaneously. The Apple video terminal can display the contents of 192 memory locations at once on the screen. That's a lot. Well, at least it was back there. And the firmware in PROMS enables you to in enter, display, and debug programs all in hex. What a win. Uh, from the keyboard, rendering a front panel unnecessary. The firmware also allows your programs to print characters on the display, and since you'll be looking at letters and numbers instead of just LEDs, the doors open to all kinds of alphanumeric software. Wow, wave of the future. So this is where they were at. I mean, it was like a huge deal. And uh, of course, they sold it for an unusual price. Um, which they thought initially was just funny, and then they didn't, uh, you know, they later discovered the furor that they unleashed by proposing this price. Um, obviously pissed off a bunch of people. Um, but it was kind of a big deal that uh, they were putting this kind of thing together, and it was, it was a big step forward. Okay, so what we're going to do next, there was something else I wanted to say about IA32, but I, or, uh, but, about, oh yeah, that's right. Um, if you happen to have one of these old Apple computers, um, Apple ones, you can sell them for like a couple hundred thousand dollars now. It's crazy. They're real collector's items. So some of these things, you could probably build an Apple one for a 5X project. Like it's that simple. Uh, and a lot of these early computer, uh, microcomputers, you could build as a 5X project. Um, you could probably even put them all on a programmable device. I mean, it's, it's crazy how, how uh, much things have shrunk. But, uh, you know, if you happen to have the original device kicking around, you can sell it for quite a lot of money now. So what we're going to do now is cover IA32 Bootstrap because um, basically this is the platform that we're going to be working on all term. And it's the platform, you probably have one in front of you, many of you do, uh, you know, so it's just uh, really common. And it's not too dissimilar from other processors, so uh, it definitely gives you a sense of the difficulty, the challenges that arise. Also, especially on a uh, processor that has a long history. Okay, so operating systems run on hardware, hardware is complicated, and this is really true of IA32 because 
um, sort of the, the personal computer platform, the Intel processor-based personal computer platform, has been around for a long time, early 80s, and a lot of the hardware, they've actually retained backward compatibility all the way along. In fact, when you work on your second assignment, a lot of the documentation is for devices that were physical chips on the motherboard back in the PC XT days, and they're pretty straightforward to program. We don't actually work with the more advanced hardware because it's just too complicated. So we just work with the old versions that are still supported even on modern computers, which is kind of fun. So uh, well-designed de operating systems do obscure these details, thankfully. And uh, you can't avoid them, though, in the bootstrap process. And you'll see this when you want to configure some device and you have to send data to its ports to you know, get the device to do various things. And so uh, you'll, you'll see some of that in your PC booter. But a lot of that is even obscured uh, by the facilities I give you. IA32 processors, when they start up, they automatically start executing instructions at a specific address. So that's the address that they specifically start executing at. And you could ask the question, well, what happens if you don't have enough memory? Well, then you just throw away address lines and you ignore them and you just use the, uh, the lower address bits. So you just make sure that you put a memory where those addresses or where that address sits. And so then you can say, these are the instructions to execute. Now you'll see that you start at F0. So how many instructions do you have? Well, you have 16 bytes, basically 0 to, you know, F0 up to FF. That's all the bytes that you have. So what do you do? You put a jump there to something else that's much more interesting. So you'll plop a ROM in there, and that first instruction will be go to the actual firmware that I want you to use for, for booting. Also, the processor starts off in ring zero because I should be able to do anything that I want at this point. And so that's really nice. Uh, you'll also notice that for the PC booter that, uh, you know, you can do anything. You can talk to any of the hardware that you want because uh, you start out in kernel mode. And there's two categories of bootloaders. I've kind of, you, you may already be familiar with this, but there's PC BIOS, which we'll talk about this time. And then EFI, which later became UEFI, when it became standardized and actually became more widely utilized. Um, there's still not great support for UEFI across the board. Apple tends to bend the rules on it, so it, um, you can't just necessarily boot anything on a Mac uh, unless you really try to jump through some hoops. But uh, generally, it's getting more and more widely um, supported. So PC BIOS, this was the first firmware that was on x86 computers. And uh, basically, it's the same issue that we have with operating systems. Okay? We have certain facilities that programs need, except at this point, our programs are bootloaders, trying to get the system up and running. So uh, the, the first feature that we have is a firmware bootloader to start the bootstrap process, a library of basic operations we might want to perform with the hardware, so that I don't have to think about all the details. I don't have to say, hey, what kind of hard disk are you? What kind of floppy disk are you? Thankfully, we don't have to ask that question anymore. How do I change into this graphics mode? I have no idea what graphics hardware is in place. All of that is encapsulated in the BIOS, and it's exposed through a few simple operations. And then the nice-to-have feature is a user interface for configuring your computer. Probably many of you have used this kind of user interface. You go in, you say, here are the hard disks that I have in my computer. Here's the current system time until you get NTP running or something like that, and you can synchronize against a time server. Uh, all of those kinds of basic issues you can go in and configure in your BIOS. Okay? This approach started back in, you can see the 70s, which is kind of shocking, uh, just after I was born that uh, CPM was an operating system, and it needed the ability to interact with the computer hardware. You kind of had two approaches. Apple was really constrained, uh, constraining on what hardware it would support. You support, you know, we're going to run computers with our hardware. You can't just plug any random stuff into it. You can only use our hardware. Personal computers were very different. You could plug anything you wanted into them. And so that obviously made it difficult to support from software, and so the BIOS really helped to, uh, to sort of cover up over that uh, variability you could have in the hardware. And so, like I say here, the BIOS was originally loaded from disk by firmware. And, of course, you started out with IBM. IBM was the first company producing personal computers. 
and they were kind of expensive. I remember because I wanted one, and we didn't get an IBM initially. We went and got a clone. And what people would do is they would study the IBM personal computer system, and they document it, and they do this, they call it a clean room implementation. One team would sit down, document everything that they could about how the personal computer worked, and then they would hand that manual over to another team that never studied it, and then that team would go about implementing a system following the, the documentation that was reverse engineered. And so that's how the first clones were created. They didn't always do a perfect job, but they did a pretty good job. And clearly, if they're going to support the same software that the PC supports, then they have to have the same BIOS operations supported as well. So it became a de facto standard. It wasn't agreed upon across the industry. It just sort of arose on its own. And the BIOS bootloader is very simple. So remember, we already had the processor reset. It starts at a particular address. It executes a few instructions, which jumps to the BIOS. The BIOS does you know, querying of hardware, set up its interface for programs to be able to utilize, and then it starts doing its own boot process. So we have two steps now already, and now we're getting ready to do the third. So if a hardware reset was performed, check the hardware. So you have that power on self-test. Maybe you hear the beep. Or you'll have, uh, if there's an issue, beep, 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 you know, it'll, it'll make various sounds to indicate what problem has occurred. Uh, hopefully you've never encountered that. Um, when it does, you kind of are sad and you get on the internet and look at what the beeps meant so that you can try to figure out what's wrong. Um, but, you know, you have a few things that are performed when the computer starts up from a cold reset or a hard reset. And so, yeah, like I said, uh, it uh, looks at the computer peripherals, figures out what is available, and then what it does is it goes through the bootable devices or all the storage devices that are on the computer that it knows how to talk to. And it looks for a bootloader to start the next stage. And it brings it into memory and then starts running it. Now it used to be that it would always just go through the floppy disks. That was always the way it would do it. Go through all the floppy disks and then go through all the hard disks. That's how the BIOS originally worked. Um, but now, of course, you can configure the boot order or even exclude things. Like, no, I do not want to boot off the network. I don't want my computer, you know, hacked right off the, the bat or something like that. Or, uh, you know, make sure that you turn off USB booting so that you don't accidentally cause yourself some trouble. Okay. Um, but the first sector was brought into memory. It was only a, a 512 bytes. We'll talk about some of those constraints in a moment. But each drives first sector would be brought into memory. And if the last two bytes of that boot sector were 5.5 and then AA, then the BIOS said, this is a boot sector, and it would start executing it. If it didn't have 5.5 AA, it's like, well, this isn't a bootable disk. That's how it would tell. Okay? Any questions so far? Uh, and if one of your questions is, did it really work this way? Yes, it still does, actually. <laughs> this is still basically what it does. Okay, so the BIOS has successfully identified a device with data on it. It has successfully loaded the, the first sector. It has successfully identified the boot signature, 55AA. So it loads it into this address, 7C00, and then it jumps to the beginning of it. And that's basically all the BIOS does. It's like, okay, now it's somebody else's job. So now we're on stage three. This boot sector is only 512 bytes. That's not a lot of space to do stuff. Okay? Um, the reason why it's 512 bytes is that this has been the size of sectors forever, except now that it's not, we're actually starting to move to four kilobyte sectors, but those drives are still capable of emulating a 512 byte sector for this kind of purpose. But I have a feeling with UEFI, we're going to start stepping away from that more and more. So UEFI is kind of the wave of the future and uh, BIOS will become less and less common. Uh, it'll probably also change the way that we teach this bootstrap process mechanism. The kind of assignments you can do will change a lot. Um, but anyway, you can see here we have 200 hex bytes or 512 bytes. So the bootloader occupies these addresses, 7C00 to 7DFF. Okay? We have 510 bytes to do our thing. The BIOS doesn't leave the bootloader completely in the dark. It actually tells the bootloader what disk drive it came from. So in DL, it actually passes a number that says this is the drive number of the drive that the bootloader was loaded from. So if the bootloader just wants to pull more data off the exact same disk, 
It can just use DL for the drive number and pass that to BIOS functions, and it can suck the rest of the uh, program off of the disk. That becomes really helpful for our PC booter because DL will have the PC booter's boot sector drive number, and we can just use that same drive number to load the rest of our program into memory. Okay. Bootloaders almost always written in assembly language. It is exceedingly rare to see a bootloader written in another language, and if it is, it's typically a really bad idea. Because the programming is not hard, and the space is at such a premium that you want to be able to uh, make sure that you're going to be able to fit everything into the bootloader. Now, um, just again about the assignment, I'm really glad that you guys are doing a PC booter because it means that you have a lot of space in that boot sector to do your thing. When I finished my solution version of the bootloader, I still had basically half of the boot sector left to put whatever I wanted into it. That's a lot of free space if you're writing a bootloader. The previous lab that we did for bootloading, uh, students were frequently overrunning the size of the boot sector which is really annoying. It forces you to think very carefully about how you, how you program stuff in the boot sector. Um, thankfully, we have tons of space, so you don't have to be really cautious about that. You can be kind of uh, relaxed and not worry about those things. You can, you can follow good software engineering practices and not write spaghetti code because you don't have to. So this is why it became hard the last time you know, we had a different lab. Um, you have disk partitioning, which was a mechanism that allows you to store multiple logical drives or partitions on a single physical device. So that first sector doubles as a master boot record. Okay, so it has a bootloader in it, but it also specifies details about those disk partitions. And so like I say here, it's uh, up to four partitions, each with its own format and use. Each partition would have a type that says this is the kind of operating system, or this is the kind of partition. And then operating systems would be able to identify their own partitions when they boot by looking at the partition types. And you may even have OSs that require multiple partitions. I mentioned a couple of one, or I, I only mentioned Linux here. Um, historically, it was really common to create a swap partition for Linux. Now Linux can also use a partition file, so you don't actually need to have a separate partition anymore. Uh, what else? Windows was really interesting in that its bootloader could only load <laughs> it's information from a certain point. So you frequently had a Windows boot partition that had to be a certain size, and then you could create another partition for the rest of the operating system. Uh, you know, so you had these kinds of hoops that you sometimes had to jump through. It typically was because of constraints of the BIOS that they had these, these issues. So you might have multiple partitions just for a particular operating system. Now, of course, technical issues, you love them. So uh, anyway, the, the master boot record doesn't really know what constraints operating systems need to satisfy. Like Linux may want to be loaded at one address. Windows may want to be loaded at a different address. Some other operating system may have a completely different set of constraints. So what do you do? Typically, the partition would, again, devote its first sector to be the bootloader for that operating system. Obviously, Linux swap doesn't need a bootloader. It would have a sector without 55AA at the end. But uh, the Linux boot partition would have a bootloader that says this is what to do next. Okay, so you can see already, we're starting to get layer upon layer to get this system up and off the ground. So the, the uh, master boot record has to get the next bootloader going. Now, of course, you have a further constraint that this partition data takes up space as well. Uh, for partition table entries, they were 16 bytes per entry. I loved playing with these when I was younger. I would typically write assembly language programs to go in and manipulate these things in ways they were not intended to be manipulated, but it was fun. Uh, so the older style format, you can see 512 bytes minus the boot signature, 55AA, minus this partition table, leaves you 446 bytes to get the next stage loaded. That was all the space that you had. Newer master boot records contain even more information. Okay, so that shrinks it down even more. And notice, now you have 434 to 436 bytes, depending on the MBR format, and it's broken into two parts. So now you have a chunk of code, and you have to jump to another chunk of code just to get your program running. 
So you know that you're going to lose some space to jumps, you know, anytime it's broken apart like that. So that's, that's not good. And you can already see that if you have some kind of sophisticated bootloader, there's no way that it could possibly fit into 434 bytes. So again, you may be familiar. Does anybody uh, use Lilo ever? So that used to be a really popular loader when I was young. Um, stands for Linux Loader. Probably everybody's heard of Grub, right? If anybody who runs Linux has probably heard of Grub. And they even have new versions of Grub now. Um, Grand Unified Bootloader. There are hundreds and hundreds of kilobytes. There's no way that you could fit that all into a boot sector. So Grub has a Grub bootloader that loads the next stage of Grub. And then that goes ahead and does all of the sophisticated bootstrapping stuff. Same thing with Lilo. These bootloaders have multiple stages as well. So the MBR loads a partition bootloader, but it's interesting because remember the partition bootloader, what does it expect? The partition bootloader expects to be at 7C100 where the MBR bootloader is. The partition bootloader expects to see DL being the address or the, uh, the, the disk drive number of where it should be loaded from. So we have an issue that the MBR loader needs to replace itself with the partition loader. So it emulates the bootloading mechanism using chain loading. If you've heard this term, if you haven't, basically it's just the process of getting one boot bootloader to load the next bootloader. So what it does is it loads the next bootloader into 7C100, where it's supposed to be, and then jumps to 7C100 and starts running it. Okay, pretty simple. Of course, the MBR loader is there right now, and so typically what uh, these MBR loaders do is they will copy themselves to another location, frequently 600. They'll copy the sector data to 600, jump back to where it is now, and then they can go ahead and chain load the next bootloader. Why is it 600? Well, because it's available memory. A lot. <laughs> basically, at this point, the... Um, the computer is like this giant field with nothing in it, and you can do basically whatever you want. The only things that are really constrained are the interrupt vector table, is it the beginning of memory, the uh, video memory is at a specific location, and the other issue is you don't know how large the computer memory is unless you ask the BIOS. And so you have to ask the BIOS, how much memory do I have? And then you can use all of that. Um, and of course, then you have other issues, which we will talk about next time, like this A20 address line. So the original PC could only access up to one megabyte of memory. If you want to access more, you have to turn on that address line. And that was all fun, too. So, uh, you know, all of these issues you had to deal with. But what it means is bootloaders can kind of do whatever they want, which is kind of fun. Okay, so bootloaders are relying on BIOS to do their thing, and uh, they basically have the same issue that we talked about with applications running on an operating system. They don't know the addresses of the BIOS operations, so they use an indirect interaction using interrupts. Now, this is not to trap into a kernel, because everything is running at the same protection level. They can just go ahead and invoke those interrupts without any problem. So int 10... 10 being in hexadecimal. I just say int 10 because I don't like saying int 10h or int 0x10, which is, you know, all, all of it does not roll off the tongue. But that is basically all the video interactions. You want to change the display mode? Int 10. You want to print a character? Int 10. You want to draw a pixel? Int 10. It has various operations. You can specify it in AH. And then the other operation or other parameters go into the other registers and then off you go. Okay? So this is a simple example of how to print a character in teletype mode. You don't have to study this too carefully because I give you code for printing strings to the console so that you can print basic diagnostic information to your console because it turns out to be difficult to debug bootloaders. <laughs> um, thankfully, there's a way, and I, and I will show it to you on the second assignment. So it's, it's actually everything you write for the second assignment is pretty straightforward to debug, except that um, like you don't have seg faults if you're in a PC booter unless you install the appropriate exception handler on the processor and actually say, yeah, tell me if I seg fault. No, you're just going to crash. The machine's just going to crash. So uh, it's kind of exciting to program. It is. It's really fun. And it's like you bang your head against the wall for like nine hours, and then you get that one little bug fixed, 
and you just you're running around the house celebrating. This was me like a few days ago, running around the house celebrating, and my wife comes in to look, and, and all the computer screen says is hello, and that's it. And it's like, yeah. Never did I write so much code to get hello on the screen. So uh, anyway, uh, int 13 is for disk access. And so this is how you would read a sector from the disk. Um, you can see that this is a simple approach. AH is 2. AL is the number of sectors to read. CX is the cylinder. And the sector number, wait, what? And then you have the head. Again, you know, what is that? And then you have the disk drive to read, which is just, like I say here, a 0 and up are the floppy drives, and 80 and up are the hard disks. I do not know how to access USB drives and so forth. Um, I just haven't been in BIOS world long enough to know, uh, you know how you access those modern devices. And you can see that the loaded sector data goes into a particular location that you specify in other registers. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, of course, cylinder head sector. This uses the old school way of accessing disk drives where we actually always had the same number of sectors per track. And we had cylinders that were comprised of the same track on various platters and so forth. It was really limiting. You could only access up to about an 8 gig drive. I don't know if anybody here has a drive that's 8 gigs or smaller anymore, unless it's one that you have on your keychain. Okay? And even then, you probably have one larger. So this is old. And we don't like it. And you'll notice how I even say 255 heads. It turns out that Windows had a bug all the way up to Windows 95 where if you tried to have 256 heads on a drive, the operating system would fall over. Yay, go Windows. So uh, a few issues like that. So there were a lot of limitations with cylinder head sector addressing. And so people created a new one called logical block addressing where basically you just have a single index starting at zero all the way up to the maximum uh, sector number on the disk. And so you had extended read sector, which is AH is 42. And then you have DSSI is this disk address packet. And I say it's a simple data structure, except programming simple data structures in assembly language is not simple. But uh, these are the various things that you specify. The number of sectors to read, the size of the packet, where to put the data when you load it, and uh, also where to start loading. And you'll notice that these values are big because we have large drives now. So this um, disk address packet actually allows you to talk to a very large drive and load data off of it into memory. So that's the idea behind the disk address packet. You'll have to do something like this on the assignment. <laughs> now notice that I said DSSI is a segment offset pointer to a disk address packet. So the question is, what is this segment offset thing? <coughs> I don't know if you guys, in 5X, do you still use a 188 at all? Yeah? Okay, so you guys will be like, oh, man, segment offsets again. This is so annoying. Um, basically, this is the old school way that the Intel processors would access memory. So IA32 has probably four or five different modes that it can actually interact with memory. We're going to talk about a couple of them. And on the assignment, you'll get to use one that we don't really talk about, basically flat addressing without uh, paging which is really simple to use, and it gives you your full address space, so that's kind of nice. Um, but yeah, like I say, some are advanced, and some are just there because they've always been there, and everybody expects it now, which is too bad. And the funny consequence, I always think this is hilarious, is that when you start up your completely badass, I just bought it yesterday computer, it starts out acting like an 8086. And so the bootloader, this is, a, this is another thing the bootloader has to take care of, is get it into awesome hex core i7 mode as opposed to 8086 mode where it's acting like I only have 640 kilobytes of memory and I can't use 32-bit uh, values and I don't even know what 64-bit is or any of that stuff. You have to get it out of that uh, mode into cool modes. Okay, so IA32 has a segmented memory model and what this really means is that we divide memory into regions. They just happen to be named segments. Okay? And what this region is, or how regions are managed, is dictated by the memory addressing mode. And so real addressing mode is very simple. We have only 16-bit registers, which is not entirely true, I'll mention that in a second, but the instruction pointer is 16 bits, flags is 16 bits, um, you have all your general purpose registers, notice we chop the E off of them, they're only 16 bits. 
And the segment registers CS, DS, SS, and ES, and then of course you have FS and GS if you really need more. Um, they used to not have them, but they do now. Everybody has them now. So, uh, but I almost never need them. Typically you use DS, SS, and ES, and then obviously you always use CS. Um, now if you're on a 32-bit processor, you can still access the 32-bit registers in 16-bit code. But the instruction encoding is different than in 32-bit code which is super fun, and I ran into a hideous bug when I was creating the bootloader for you guys. Um, thankfully, it's well documented now, so you shouldn't run into that same issue. Okay. So real addressing mode, we have 20 bits of address space, so one megabyte. Um, MIB is not men in black, I suppose it could be, but uh, it means megabyte or a mega binary byte, so uh, it just means like the two to the 20 as opposed to a one with six zeros, so it's little bit more. Uh, 20 bit address, you can see that we combine the segment value and the offset value. This is how we compute addresses in real addressing mode. So segment, shifted left four bits, multiply it by 16, and then we add in the offset. Okay, so that value is called a segment selector. And you notice a couple weird consequences. It blew my mind when I was trying to understand this as a kid. Okay, each segment is 64 kilobytes and they overlap. Just really confusing. But each segment is 16 bytes further than the previous segment, okay, which means that you can have multiple addresses that refer to the exact same byte. Okay, so these are two addresses that actually refer to the same byte, A5C0, 2DE1, and A5BF, 2DF1. And let the fun commence. So the segment register that you use depends on what operation you're performing. Clearly, if you're using IP to look up an instruction, it automatically, implicitly uses the code segment. If you use push, pop, push A, push F, pop, whatever, uh, then it's going to use the stack segment register. Uh, if you do anything with memory, it's going to use the data segment register. But you can also specify the segment register. Or another really clever idea is set them all to be the same segment so you don't have to care, which is what I usually do. It's like, why man, you know, why deal with this stuff? So if you wanted to pull a byte of memory because you were looking at a particular instruction or copying an instruction somewhere, you could use CS as the segment selector. Or if you want to get something off the stack because you want to access an argument, then you can specify the stack segment selector and so forth. Okay. And like I say, just because you do something with the stack pointer does not mean that it will automatically use the stack segment. So um, this is why it's really nice to set DS and SS to be the same, because then you don't have to worry about these things. Okay? So this is real addressing mode. You'll have to know a little bit about this, because you will have to write some bootloader code, and it will be in real addressing mode. And you'll actually get to write the code that gets you into protected mode. Um, it's not long, it's just confusing. So, uh, you know, it's, it's like the four most confusing instructions you ever wrote in your life. Actually, one of them is really simple. The uh, three most confusing instructions. In okay. Anyway, um, so you can move values into these things except for CS. Because if you're doing uh, a move into CS, you might, you know, the processor's like, no, you can't do that. You just have to jump. Okay. So uh, bootloaders typically set up their own data and stack. Notice we just set AX to zero, move that into both DS and SS. You're not allowed to move constants into the segment selectors. You have to move a register value into the segment selectors. And you can see, again, where should the stack go? Wherever we want it. So we just start it uh, at F000 and it'll grow down from there. That gives us uh, plenty of space. Now, um, what would happen if an interrupt occurred between these last two instructions? Again, 5x folks all already know the answer to this. So I set the stack segment, I change the stack segment selector, and then an interrupt occurs. Well, what does the interrupt do? Yeah, it pushes a bunch of stuff onto the stack, and then it tries to jump to the interrupt handler. Well, that part will work fine, but when the interrupt handler returns, we end up in la-la land. So we really shouldn't have an interrupt between those two operations. And so... Like I say, here, it would, uh, basically we'd have some horrible issues start occurring. And so when you move anything into SS, interrupts are suspended for one instruction. 
Okay, sure. Um, I don't know how they found this problem, but probably somebody thought of it and said, well, we should probably design this effectively to avoid this issue. So uh, basically, it allows us to do SS and then SP in two instructions. Now, you can also use LSS if you want to set them in one, but who cares? Okay. Also, like I mentioned, man, uh, mentioned before, the uh, real mode interrupt table is different than the protected mode interrupt table. When I first wrote my bootloader, I had a problem that I failed to realize that I was accidentally loading the rest of my program over the interrupt vector table. And so I was confused as to why my computer kept falling over. Well, I was overwriting the interrupt vector table and then trying to call BIOS interrupts and things were exploding. Okay? So you have to be careful because anybody can write to this memory region and it can really mess things up. Typically, you won't mess with this in your bootloader. You just use it. But when you transfer into your own program, then you need to go into 32-bit mode and set up the interrupt descriptor table. Okay. So anyway, you have various things that you can control with that. Okay. We won't talk about that. Now, IA32 also has protected mode, which is really nice. You get all the memory protection facilities that IA32 has to offer, plus you also get optional paging. You can do address translation, all kinds of other cool stuff. But it is optional. The other thing is you still have these same segment registers, which is kind of weird. They're still 16 bits, but now they're used differently. Okay. So you still have CSEIP, SSESP, DS operations for moves and so forth from memory. So these segment selectors no longer are used directly. We don't use them in some function to compute addresses from segment selectors. Instead, they, they use something called the global descriptor table which describes all the memory segments that your computer is configured to have. Okay? So uh, basically the descriptors say this is where the segment starts, this is how large it is, these are the memory protections that you're uh, required to have for that uh, segment. And so there's a register, GDTR, which you can load with LGDT. You'll have to do that. I give you the instruction. It's very straightforward. I give you the global descriptor table register, so, or I'm sorry, the global descriptor table, so you don't have to figure it out. It's complicated enough. So uh, you just plug that descriptor table into the global descriptor table register, and then it will start being used by the processor for memory access. There's various segment descriptors. Okay? And like I was saying, the size of the segment, the privilege level of the segment, the type of the segment, is it code, is it read-only data, is it read-writable data, so forth. And so, oh, and the base address is really important. We'll talk about that in a second as well. But what we can do is we can set up a flat addressing model where we basically say, yes, this segment starts at address zero, physical address zero, and it is the entire address space. So it's just a one-to-one -one mapping. And you can say, here's one that's code, here's one that's data, and so forth. And then the segment selectors, so CS, DS, ES, all of those, SS, are just indexes into this table. So CS is a specific segment descriptor index, and so forth. Okay, so yeah, this is where it starts to get dry, and I apologize, but it, you have to understand. So segment selector offset, segment selector is 16 bits, offset is 32 bits. That is a logical address. And it is mapped to a linear address using the segment descriptors. So notice, we pull out the segment selector's descriptor. We pull the base address. That's the, the reference point. We add the offset, which is from the logical address. We add the offset to the base address. And that gives us the linear address that we then access for that segment. You can see why I like to set the base address to zero, because then it's just a simple one-to-one -one mapping. You don't have to think. It just goes across. If the offset ends up being beyond the size of the segment, then you get a protection error. Okay, you tried to access beyond the segment. So you can actually use this to constrain memory relatively effectively. Now, what happens after this? Well, then you have the virtual memory system. And that linear address will be mapped to a physical address. Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, one of the things I want you to see is that the IA32 processor is incredibly sophisticated. It has all this cool stuff that it can do, but we use like a little fraction of it because we really don't need that much for our operating systems. Frequently, we just do flat address spaces, and then we do virtual memory so that we can map blocks to physical blocks and do our whole thing. We don't really use this segmented model very much. 
It used to be that people loved the segmented model because they didn't really have paging. You know, there's a history there with virtual memory. We'll talk about that when we talk about virtual memory. But we don't need it, so we don't really use it. Let's see a few other things. So pictorially, this is what we look like. Segment selector, we look up the segment descriptor using the uh, global, you know, global descriptor table register. We add in the base address and the offset to give us a linear address. And then that is mapped to the physical address by the virtual memory hardware if we turned it on, which we don't have to. Okay, any questions? Really straightforward. You don't have to think about this too much, thankfully, for your PC booter. But this is the mechanism by which it's translating addresses. This will become a little bit more important when you get into the fourth project and actually do user mode versus kernel mode. This will become a, an important thing again. Okay, so logical to linear. Uh, you can do very complex segmented memory models, but we basically always use a flat memory model because it's really simple. Why do all that segmentation? Well, there was a reason, but we don't do it anymore. And we use virtual memory to actually imp uh, impose process isolation. Okay, so that's the deal there. Um, you'll see this note when you get into the code. It's not a big deal to talk about it now. Does anybody have any questions? All right, so we're okay right now. Let's see, a few other things. Interrupt handling. So uh, this is interesting. I'm going to throw this up here. There's this whole other thing of like, how do you actually dispatch interrupts when you change protection levels? Remember, when you change protection levels, you change stacks. And you need to configure this task register to set up the change of protection levels. But we don't need it for our PC booter, so I'm not even going to talk about it because it's just extra information. So what we'll do next time, you can see, oh man, all we did was talk about the state of the machine when it boots. Okay, we went through like three or four phases of bootstrapping. We're still in BIOS. We're still in real addressing mode. We still only understand 16-bit values. We can do some 32-bit stuff if we need to, but not very much. So what we'll talk about next time is the rest of the process that gets to the operating system kernel, gets into protected mode, configures stuff, and then we'll spend some time talking about UEFI because it really is the wave of the future and uh, it's going to supplant all this bio stuff. So, all right, we'll see you all on Friday.